let's see. Any other questions? We're in the middle of population genetics. That's what we were focusing on. That's what we're going to finish up today. And then we're going to talk a little bit about race, um, which is kind of a question of that relates to population genetics. Um, and then on Tuesday, I'm sorry, Monday of next week, we will start primates. So you will um, get your primate assignment. You'll really start primates on Saturday when you go to the zoo with, with your docent, but we'll start in class on Monday. Uh, if you are doing the scholar's option, the scholar's option has been posted, and it involves doing an observation of a primate species at the zoo. So you can do that after we have our tour, if you want. You don't have to do it then. You could go back to the zoo if you're a, if you're a scholar's program participant. Um, we talked about what the scholar's program is. Not really. Way back at the beginning for a minute. Is anyone in it? How many people are in it? Raise your hand. So a couple of you. Uh, your, your assignment for this, for this class is to do an observation of a primate species. The prompt, the instructions are all online, as is the form you should fill out while you're doing the observation, and then you write a paper about them. You don't have to do it this weekend if you don't have time. It'll probably take you an extra hour and a half after the tour. So if you've made plans and can't do it, you can go back on your own. The problem is, is when you go back on your own, you're going to have to pay the zoo admission price, which is $17. This weekend, you'll have to pay 5 bucks, and you're already in the zoo. So if you can do it, doing the observation part, right, not the writing of the paper, which you don't have to turn the paper in until the very end of the class, literally the last day of finals week. You can give it to me on Friday. Um, but you might want to do the observation part this weekend if you can. It takes about an hour for the whole observation, but you also have to figure out which species you're going to observe. And you can decide that while you're getting the tour, because the tour will take you to all the different primate species, and you can remember which ones you thought were interesting or had groups that were active, because you want to observe you know, something that's active. You don't want to observe something that's hiding, right? Um, for the rest of you, if you don't know what the Scholars Program is, uh, the Scholars Program is an honors program. In fact, it's changing its name from Scholars Program to Honors Transfer Program, uh, which was a decision I made, actually. Uh, I feel like I'm rebranding a company or something, so I'm trying to gently, gently affect the transition to Honors Transfer Program, which is what they call it at every other community college in the state. Um, we thought uh, PCC has this kind of tendency to do things our own way because we think that's better, and I completely disagree. So I just made a decision and changed the name. Uh, well, I mean, I got some people to agree before I did it, but anyway. So basically, it's a program where you participate uh, by uh, doing an extra project that's often research-based in the classes you take, and then your professors will report to me that you did this project and you get honors credit for it. In order to complete the program, you have to do this in six classes or for 18 units total. When you've done that, you're certified as an honor student, which gives you priority transfer consideration to a number of universities. The most important of them is UCLA. UCLA is the most important university at all because I got my PhD and two masters from there. But I, and I encourage you to go because it's a great school. It's our number one transfer school among the UCs as well, actually. More of our students go to UCLA than any other UC. More students go to Cal State LA than any school, but among the UCs, UCLA is number one. Um, it, we also have similar agreements with UC Riverside, UC Irvine, Pomona, a couple of other, um, Mills College. We have a few colleges around, around the state. And they all will give you priority transfer status. It used to be guaranteed back in the old days. When the program started, it guaranteed you transfer to USC, but things are a little more competitive now. But it does give you priority. It also looks good on your applications to wherever you go. It's good to say you're an honor student. Um, it is a bit more work, and if you are planning on applying to transfer for, you know, you're going to apply, say, in November to transfer for next fall, if you haven't started the program at all, you won't have enough time to complete it because you have to do it in six different classes. Not all classes offer the option. for The, the schedule for the spring classes, for those of you who are in the program, should be posted today on the website. So what you want to do is search scholars or honors on the website. It'll come up. You can download the schedule, and then you can start deciding what you're going to enroll in. Okay. I encourage you to participate in the program, if, particularly if you're a first-year student. You're going to be here not only the rest of this year in the spring, but also the following year. 
then you can finish the program. Um, besides the fact that it's good for your resume, it is also something um, that may help you in the future enroll in courses uh, because I'm in the process of getting the administration of this college to give priority enrollment to students who are in the program, which means if, you've, if you're in the program, to get in the program, you just fill out an application. You can download it from the website and hand it to me in this class, and then you'll be part of the program. If you're part of the program uh, in good standing, it may help you get higher priority enrollment in the fall. And it seems that the administration has agreed to do this. I have a lot of powerful people on my side. Um, I hope they're listening right now. Uh, yes, I, I'm telling you, the, the answer to getting anything done, especially in an administrative structure like a bureaucracy like this college, is just to not shut up until people are so irritated with you that they agree to do whatever you want, which is exactly what I've done for about a year now, and they've all, I've got them all behind me. I've got the president, I've got two vice presidents, I've got at least one or two board members. I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much going to be running this school in another year or so. Uh, but yeah, so what I want to do is get classes that are designated for honors and then also get priority enrollment for you in your other classes. So it's not a bad idea to be part of the program. Besides finishing the 18 units, the other thing you have to do is have an overall GPA of above 3.0. It has to be above 3.1 for UCLA because they're a little bit more fussy. So if your GPA, this has to be the, your GPA at the end of the program. So if it's lower than that now, you can get in it, get in the program, you can apply. But to complete the program, you have to have that level of GPA. It's possible that when I ask for priority enrollment from the administration, they're going to say they're only going to give it to the people who have the GPA above 3.0. So I don't know what conditions they'll put on it, and I'll have to see how that plays out. Um, the other thing is, is that in every class that you take for, a, for the honors credit, you have to get a B or better. So if you don't get a B in the class, even if you finish the project, you don't get the scholar's credit. Scholars, as it's been called. Sir? I'm sorry, um, this is on one no, you take it over the course of, of several semesters, because you're talking about six classes total, so you'll do a couple each semester. Uh, the way the program is run, you can complete your last two classes in the spring after you apply for transfer. So if you apply for transfer, say, in November or December, you can take your final two classes the spring after that, and that's considered acceptable. But you couldn't do, like, five of them, right? Because I have to tell UC whatever, UCLA, let's say, that, you know, Honey Boo Boo is an honors student, right? They send me a list of the people who have applied for transfer, and it says, here's all the people who applied to UCLA for transfer. How many of these people have completed the honors program? And I fill out a form and certify you with a counselor here. So in order for you, honey, to be, to be, <laughs> to be certified, you have to have that much of the program completed before that spring semester after you apply for transfer, because I have to do the certifications in February. So... That's the program. I encourage you to take a look at it. If all of this is too much information or I lost you about five minutes ago, you can get all of this from the actual website. If you just search scholars on the PCC website, the web page comes up. Yes? It should be um, the equivalent of 18 units, right? Not necessarily, Not necessarily six classes. It's only 18 units. The other thing is, is that if you take a scholar, we have, we have what's called scholars blocks, although, again, we're changing the name to honors, so they're now honors blocks. But those are classes that are linked, and you take three classes, usually three. Occasionally, the block has two classes that are linked. But has anyone taken a block class here? Are you in it now? Oh, no, I took it my first Which one did you take? Um, English, and Oh, you did? Okay, great. So you did the one with the environmental theme. Yeah, they all have themes. They're classes that are linked together. You take them all. Um, they're quite useful if you're desperate for classes because since they're all linked, you have to enroll in all three, and that means that they tend to fill up last, actually, among the sections that we have. Because some people can't take all three of them. They have, like, a work schedule or something like that. So if you have really low priority for enrollment and you're looking for classes, provided the block, you know, will satisfy requirements you need to fill, it's not a bad thing to, to start out in. You also get automatic honors credit for the block classes, provided you get a B or better, and you don't have to do any extra projects. 
So it, it automatically confers it for you. And it's three classes, so it's half of what you need to complete the whole program. You also get automatic honors credit for any class you get a B or better in as a part of study abroad. So if you go on any study abroad program, we give you on automatic honors credit too, and that can fill up your requirement quite quickly. And you get to go to places like Florence or Oxford or Madrid, because we have, we have a really great uh, study abroad program here. Uh, in fact, they're recruiting for the Oxford program now, and there's, there's, some, uh, there's some information meetings coming up. I'll announce the date. There's one in November. I think the last one's in November. So they're looking for people for Oxford. And I've taught on both of those programs, and they're awesome. It's much more exciting to take classes like this in a place like Florence. Not that Pasadena is not great. Believe me, I love Pasadena like my own mother. But Florence is another story. Man, I love Florence. Florence is the best place I ever lived. It took me six months after I got back to L.A. I was so depressed. I was just in this culture shock. It was so, it's like, I was like, I can't live in L.A. It's so horrible. I need beauty and art and pretty people with great taste in clothes and medieval architecture and saints. Anyway, whatever. It's fantastic. Trust me. You can trust me. I mean, except with exams. All right, so all that's been recorded for posterity. If you want any of that information, you can get it off of Tegrity or off of the websites through the PCC website. Okay, so any questions about any of that? Okay, how many of you, let me ask a question. How many people in this room are possibly applying for transfer this fall? Okay, how many of you will apply to UCLA? Okay, on November 9th, the Transfer Alliance Program Conference, it's a Friday, occur, uh, occurs at UCLA. And it is a, a day-long conference that is completely dedicated uh, to um, the transfer process for UCLA. And you go to UCLA and they teach you everything you need to know about transferring, about scholarships, about research, about programs, support, all that kind of stuff that you can get when you're there. It's an awesome conference. I take a bunch of students as part of the honors program. Anybody can sign up. I'm going to post the flyer with the information about signing up because you have to sign up in advance and reserve a spot on your course website. So I'm going to put it up as an announcement on the Canvas website that will have all the information you need to go to the TAP conference. But if you have that Friday free and you're serious about going to UCLA, I really recommend that you go because you'll get all the information you need in about a half-day conference. The, the lunch is, it lasts till after lunch, but it's not a full day. You're out of there by the afternoon. So and it's, it's very, very useful. It's really exciting, and you can walk around and see the campus and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the transfer center here actually will provide you with transportation to the conference if you request it, and you can sign up for that in the transfer center. Okay, so that's called the TAP conference, Transfer Alliance Program, which is what Honors is part of. Right, that's that's the that's the program at UCLA that we have our relationship with. Okay, there's a lot, and that's a lot of information for you. Um, go to UCLA; it's a great place, best school in the world. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not biased just because I went there myself for about 13 years, and now I actually teach there in the summers. But for the for the TAP conference, for the for the honors program, if you haven't started it and you're applying this fall for next year. You don't have enough time to finish it. It doesn't mean that you won't get into UCLA. It just means that you don't have time to finish the honors program. You know, what I need to do more of, and this is what I'm trying to get the administration to sort of support, and I think they are supportive, is that, you know, I should be giving this speech right now to a class of high school people that are coming to, to Pasadena. Not, well, I mean, I can give it to you guys too. It's fine. But if you've already been here for a year, it's tough to finish the program. So what we really need to do is catch everyone when they first get here and give them the information. But if you don't, I mean, if you don't complete the honors program, it doesn't mean you won't get into UCLA. It just means that you're not going to complete the honors program. You should still go to the TAP conference, though. It's a, it's a really good thing. It's really, it's really good for you. Okay. All right. How are we? We need to record. How is this doing this? There we go.
It's so weird. Okay. Um, genetic drift was the last thing we talked about, correct? Sorry, this has been like an unusually difficult day to get things uh, to get things done. Okay, so what is genetic drift? Let's just do a quick review because I think this concept is actually the one that's the hardest for people to remember. What is genetic drift? What is the definition of it? Yes. No, no, that's bottleneck. That's bottleneck. Yes. Yes, so it's the random fluctuation in allele frequencies in a population due to chance. That's the definition of it. And the most important fact about it mathematically is that it impacts smaller populations to a greater extent. It is a bigger factor on smaller populations, okay? Now, um, let's talk about mitochondrial DNA. We talked a little bit about it before. Mitochondrial DNA is uh, a special type of DNA that is found in your cell's mitochondria. Its independent existence separate from your somatic DNA is one of the lines of evidence that suggests that at some point in history, before eukaryotes evolve, there was a separate organism, that mitochondria was a separate organism that has been assimilated into cell structure at some very early stage in evolutionary history. Um, mitochondrial DNA is fairly simple. Um, within the cell, the mitochondria are organelles where energy metabolism occurs. So they have kind of like a symbiotic relationship with the cell structure in general. That's at least what seems to be the case from an evolutionary perspective. The mitochondrial DNA is very, very simple when you compare it to somatic DNA. There's only about 16,600 base pairs. That is the equivalent of about 37 genes. Okay? Um, mitochondrial DNA is inherited directly from the mother, so it is not subject to the process of recombination, which is when you're you know, your parents' genes combined together. It just basically, except for accrued mutations, your mitochondrial DNA will be exactly like your mother's, okay? In a sense, you're at the mitochondrial DNA level, a clone of your mother. But mutations occur anyway, even though there's not the process of recombination going on. And that means... Um, that, you know, uh, I mean, it's similar actually with clones, right? When things produce asexually, they still actually accrue mutations. That does happen. Um, in the case of mitochondrial DNA, the mutation rate is much, much higher than it is for somatic DNA, okay? So over and over again in your readings and in this class and the films I show you, you're going to hear this statistic that human beings are approximately... 1.2% difference than a chimpanzee, different than a chimpanzee at the DNA level, okay? Or you'll hear 1 to 2% or 2% or, you know, humans and chimps are 98% the same. You hear, you hear different variants on the same figure. Whereas you have 1 to 2% somatic DNA differences between you and a chimp, you and a chimp have 8 to 10% difference in your mitochondrial DNA. Okay, and that's the product of a faster mutation rate. And that means that mitochondrial DNA is actually quite useful for understanding how closely related different groups of people are, meaning like people that come from Africa versus people that come from South America versus people that come from Pasadena or whatever. Even families actually will have distinct mitochondrial DNA configurations. Okay, so it's very useful for figuring out how different groups of people are related to each other because its mutation rate is faster. So we're all more different from each other, and that's that's very useful. It's also simple; like it's not very complicated. There's not that many base pairs, so you can find the differences most easily. Now, more easily. Now, the differences, like the differences among humans in general, with you know polymorphisms at the genetic level typically are found in the junk category because junk mutations don't affect 
the phenotype. So you can accrue junk mutations in mitochondrial DNA, and it doesn't imp impact the structure of your mitochondria, the same way your somatic DNA junk does not, if it mutates, affect your phenotype. Okay? So basically what that means is, is that in the whole segment of mitochondrial DNA, which is 16,600 base pairs or 37 genes, and you can have genetic diseases that are caused by mutations in the coding regions, but what you're interested in, if you're trying to figure out how closely two people are related to one another, is the junk section, which is this purple part right here that's known as the D loop or control region, if you know you want to use the general term, but it's known as the D loop. So the non-coding regions are subject to high mutation rates, and for studying evolutionary relationships between closely rated species, subspecies, conspecifics, even families can have specific sequences, okay? And I mentioned this to you before when we first talked about genetics, that if you send a DNA swab into a company that traces your family's heritage, it is the mitochondrial DNA that they're going to focus on. That's different if you send a swab into, say, a company that's going to be evaluating your risk for genetically-based disorders, you know, tendencies toward genetically-based disorders such as cancer, for some forms of cancer. Yes, please. Yes. Yes, we'll talk about that, actually. Did you see that in a film? Yeah. Do you remember what it was? I'd be curious if you can remember. Yes. What humans do. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Um, we did, I think, you, you weren't in the last class, right? You weren't here? Yeah, in the last class we talked a little bit about um, the, f the notion of variation within populations, right? Like we've all got genetic differences within our species, right? That's variation. Uh, and human variation is very low. In fact, I'll show you some information on that, but that's absolutely true. Uh, and that's what you discover when you look at mitochondrial DNA. Now, theoretically, if the mitochondrial DNA suggests that humans are all closely related to each other, but helps us understand how, it should be backed up by the information that you get from somatic DNA. In other words, you should be able to check what you learn from mitochondrial DNA with somatic DNA. And that took a while because verifying the mitochondrial results with somatic DNA is complicated because somatic DNA is massive. But that's actually been done for most of this. In other words, they've verified the reliability of the mitochondrial DNA. So this is a three-dimensional histogram, or actually it's two-dimensional histogram, which shows variation, genetic variation in um, substitutions uh, per nucleotide within the genomes of chimpanzees and three human populations, okay? And basically, you read it like this. The graphs show the mean number of differences per nucleotide in one region of mitochondrial DNA for chimps on the left and humans on the right, okay? The red bars indicate variation within populations, okay? In other words, the way you read this, the chimps are divided into three subspecies. This is an important point, actually, when we start talking about human races. So depending on where you are in Africa, you will be, as a chimp, a member of the species called Pantroglodytes. Now, if you are in the east, you are, known, you are a member of the subspecies Pantroglodytes schweinfurthi, which is named after the person that first described them. If you're in the central part of uh, Africa, then you're Pantroglodytes troglodytes. If you have multiple subspecies of a species, one of them always has the name of the species repeated as the subspecies name. That's why sometimes you hear our species called Homo sapiens sapiens. It's not that you're repeating the word because you don't need to, it's that we are a member of a particular subspecies of that group, right? And our subspecies is the first one that they discovered, so we get to be called Homo sapiens sapiens. Then later, if you discover somebody else, they have to be Homo sapiens something else, 
right? So the original one that gets discovered first by scientists gets to duplicate the species name as the subspecies name. Okay, so then if you're in the West, you're called uh, Pantroglodytes verus. So basically the three groups are listed here, Schweinfurthi, Troglodytes verus, and then they're over here too, Schweinfurthi, Troglodytes verus. So you read the graph from two directions like this. So the red bars are within the group, meaning that here's Schweinfurthi, here's Schweinfurthi. You read up like this, and that's the variation that you see within the group called Schweinfurthi. Now, if you wanted to compare them and look at, for example, the genetic differences between Schweinfurthi and Verus, you would read it up this way and up this way, and you would arrive at this tall blue bar back at the back. Okay? So basically, the greater variation between and within these subspecies is shown in this graph, and what you see is, is that the greatest variation within chimpanzees is found between Schweinfurthi and Verus, which actually makes a great deal of sense because they're on the opposite sides of Africa. So they're furthest apart from one another geographically, and you would predict that those that are furthest apart geographically would have the greatest differences between them. Note that much, and this is the point that you're raising, that much of the variation genetically that we see in chimps as, as a whole can actually be found within any of these subspecies as well, right? And, and, the, and, and just to remind you, the, the difference of genetic variation within and genetic variation between was what we were talking about last time with the islands of the polka dot versus non-polka dot people. Remember, I told you if there was gene flow between them, this function to make them more similar in terms of allele frequency, and therefore it reduced genetic variation between them, but it increased variation within them, okay? So that's a, a sort of an illustration of what I mean by within and between. It's important to understand the differences here. Now, that's chimps. When you compare chimps to humans, a very, very different picture arises. And when this research was done, they grouped the human subjects they were studying into three groups. Okay? And these three groups are what most people would identify as three of the main races of human beings. Right? So we're starting to get into this race question. So here you've got people divided up between Africa, Asia, I'm sorry, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Europe, Asia, and Africa. And so here, again, the red bars are the variation between, within a group, Europe, Europe, right, Asia, Asia, and then Africa, Africa, while the blue bars, right, are the, are those, are the variation between. So here's Africa, Europe, right, Africa, Asia, and Asia, Europe, okay? Now, there are two outstanding differences between the data for the chimps and the data for the people. Okay, that, that illustrates some important aspects of our history as a species. What are the two things that stand out to you as different between the two sides of this? Yes? Yeah, with, in, in the case of chimps, the greatest variation is found between Schweinfurthi and Verus, but with humans, it's found within the group of Africans. Okay, that's point number one. Uh, and then the more obvious one is what? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the variation is much lower, possibly suggesting that the humans are, are younger, but then we, you know, the, we know evolutionarily that there was a common ancestor between the two groups, so they should have comparable variation unless they've gone through that bottleneck process we talked about where the population of humans dropped really low, the variation overall dropped, and then we've built our population back up from this little group of people. That doesn't appear to have happened with the chimpanzees. Or if it did, it happened so long ago that they've accrued more variation in the populations over time. But humans are much more similar to each other than chimpanzees are. It may not look like that to us because we look different, and chimps probably look the same, right? If you study chimps for a while, you can actually tell visually the differences between the three subspecies. They have little differences to them. But it's something that you only would be able to do if you studied them closely. Um, so we might look more different to ourselves than chimps do to us, but actually genetically we're quite a bit more similar. Please. Well, could it be because uh, that uh, evolution was not necessary? Because uh, pointing in the books that uh, evolutionary doesn't happen at the same pace. Uh, depends if you're not a pet, but could that be also another reason? 
It, yeah, in other words, what, what you're pointing out is Coyne's point is, is that mutations don't accrue at the same rate in every species. So some species gain variation more quickly than others, right? We just made the point with mitochondrial DNA that it mutates faster than somatic DNA. It's also the case that different species accrue mutations more quickly than others. So it's conceivably possible that with humans, what you've got is a much slower mutation rate than you do among chimpanzees. But there's no other independent evidence that supports that, and there's plenty of evidence that suggests that we actually have comparable mutation rates. So that's a perfectly good hypothesis, but it isn't supported by the data. Yeah, so I mean, there, there are other possible explanations for why, you're, you're absolutely right to bring this up, there are other possible explanations for why it is you would have this difference besides the bottleneck, but the bottleneck is the one that's the best supported by the data that we have. Yes? I was actually wondering, based on what if uh, human beings uh, have a uh, huge variation between species, so it's like 9 cells, they will find 8 cells, there's no like, selective reproduction, so any mutation is pretty much seen as a positive one, and everyone gets to reproduce anyway? Can you say all that again? <laughs> I, I'm fascinated, what you, but I'm, I'm also a bit confused, so tell me so, again. So everybody's out there mating and reproducing. Exactly. On all the, not, not only the good traits are uh, kind of passed on, but every trait is passed on. Okay. So wouldn't there be like a huge variation since there's no, uh, I guess, evolution of the same rate of the same traits going on? There's not necessarily a relationship between the success of reproduction within the species, like, you know, I told you that, that piece of data about 90% of males will reproduce in their lifetime and the amount of variation in the population. The amount of variation in the population is, is, you know, produced by other factors, some of which we've talked about when we're talking about population genetics. So the, the relationship that you're saying might have an impact on the amount of variation, variation in human uh, populations wouldn't really have that impact necessarily. Um, it can have an impact, but not to this pronounced extent would be my general answer. Um, particularly when the population is large. Again, when the population is small, that's why this bottleneck theory seems so likely. Because remember that many of these, these processes that we're talking about that produce variation in allele frequencies and that kind of thing, as we, you know, population genetics, are so much more powerful when a population is small. See, now there, now, and this might be, I think, what you're getting at, now there's so many people reproducing all the time how would you have those, that, those differences between groups accrue, right? Because everybody's got gene flow, right? Everybody's mating with everybody else, basically, like to a greater extent than we ever have in history, right? So that, in a sense, is going to um, reduce, you see, one of the questions, and this is, this is quite good, one of the questions here is, how do you get a situation with the humans where the greatest variation is within Africans and there's not that much variation between the groups, right? It, it would, seems like you get the pattern, like the chimp pattern is more logical, right, intuitively. How does this happen? Well, the answer is, again, we can look to the example I went over of the two islands, right? So again, to reduce variation between groups, as you've got reduced here with humans, what you need is gene flow between them. So what this strongly suggests is, is that historically, like in human history, there has been a great deal of gene flow between these groups, right? Now, the other thing that comes into play here historically that you'll understand in the last part of the class to a greater extent is that people start out in Africa and then they move out of Africa, which means that Europeans and Asians all have African heritage. It's just longer ago, if that makes sense, right? So there's this kind of evolutionary sense that we are all Africans, right? Not in the sense that we think of races, but ultimately, in an ultimate sense, people come from Africa. So it makes sense that Africans have the most variation because people have been there the longest. And what happened was is that a small group of them, founder effect, founder effect, founder effect, left, 
it might have happened more than a single time, obviously, but small group or groups of them leave Africa and populate the rest of the world relatively recently. Prior to that, people were in Africa for a long time without being anywhere else in the world. So that historical process explains why it is Africa has got the most variation, which raises the issue that African is not really a race from a genetic perspective. If you look at the genetics of human beings, Africa is about 12 or 13 different races of people. And everybody else in the world is about one and a half, basically. And what we have isn't really true races from a genetic perspective. What we have is different types, meaning sort of different characteristics in our look, right? Which is how people define race. <laughs> It's not the genetic definition of race, but it's how people treat it now. Okay, and we'll get more into this. This will be this will become this will become clearer. Yes. It, it is it's it's very deep, and we're going to spend the rest of the class talking about it, so it'll become clear. I'm just I'm starting out with this data because it, it links up to the population genetics topic. But let's let's talk a little bit more about what we mean by race and whether or not humans from a biological perspective actually have them. One more thing about mitochondrial DNA. Um, you know, and this relates to that final point about humans' African origins, okay? So to reiterate, the mitochondrial DNA evidence is that the greatest diversity among human beings is found in Africa, which contains many different variants that you don't find anywhere else in the world. The similarity of non-African lineages, that is to say people we call Asian or European or you know, Native Americans in the New World, they're all so similar that it strongly suggests that a small population from Africa left and colonized the rest of the world, diversifying over the course of about 50,000 years. We'll get back to this question when we talk about the fossil record. So in other words, to figure that out, what you do is you look at all the different groups of people in the world, you compare their variants in mitochondrial DNA, and you do what's called lineage coalescence, which is basically this. So let's say you're looking at mitochondrial DNA among groups of people. Uh, we could say uh, people from Scotland, you know, uh, Armenians, um, and let's say um, Samoans in Polynesia, Hawaiians, and um, oh, that's fine. Okay, so basically, if you're what lineage coalescence means is that you look at the mitochondrial DNA from all of these groups. And what you see when you look at them is, is that Samoans and Hawaiians have very similar mitochondrial DNA. That suggests a more recent common origin. That is to say, more recently, they were one group of people. Okay? So you coalesce those two lineages here. All right? Well, Scottish and Armenians are closer to each other than Samoans, than either are to Samoans, so you can coalesce them too, right? But ultimately, there's going to be a branch off here like this, which will be Scotland and Armenia, something like this. So basically, what you're doing is looking at similarities in the mitochondrial DNA. You can write this out. Uh, in the mitochondrial DNA, um, of different groups, determining who's most closely related to whom and building a, a, a human family tree. That's what lineage coalescence refers to. Okay, that's what it means. So if you do lineage coalescence of all of the world's people, what we end up with is data that suggests that all humans have a most recent common ancestral population of about 170,000 years ago. Now, as Coyne says, there are different rates of mutations in different species, and they change historically over long periods of time. The mutations don't always accrue even within a species at the same rate. 
And that means that every time you do something like lineage coalescence using the genetic clock to figure out how long ago we had a common ancestor, you always have a fairly high error factor. And that's why you know, it's, it's the middle of the error factor is 171,000 years ago, according to this particular study. But it's plus or minus 50,000 years. So it's 50,000 years on either direction around that, either earlier or later, which sounds like a big error factor. And it is a pretty big error factor. And the reason for that is, is that you can't know exact mutation rates. You have to estimate them. And they can change historically. So the genetic clock is fairly good about telling you certain things about when populations split into subgroups, but it can get messy. Particularly, for example, remember Darwin's model is you have a population, it splits in two where each group is separated from the other, and they accrue mutations over time, becoming more different from one another. And that's the same method that you're using to do lineage coalescence. You're looking at the differences and comparing them. The problem is, what happens if, in the case, I mean, just this, this isn't historically the case from what we know, but let's just say hypothetically, you have a situation where Samoans and Hawaiians split, that is to say they live on separate islands, but then at some point in their history, they reestablish gene flow. That is to say, boats start sailing back and forth between the islands, and then there's gene flow between the two populations. So you're going to have, for some period, let's say it's a few hundred years, they'll be separated, but then they're going to come back together and mate again, right? And when they mate again, that means they have gene flow, and that means that the variation between them is going to be reduced, right, as we said. And then maybe they'll separate again or something where there's no gene flow uh, between them again. In other words, when you start looking at these questions with humans, you can figure it out. But it gets kind of tangled and messy because people move around. They have contact with other people. You know, we know historically that in Central Asia, there was a great deal of gene flow between populations from Europe and populations from East Asia. Right, because there were trade routes that spanned Asia and went all the way from China to Europe. Right. Well, places like Afghanistan and Central Asia in general are sort of like crossroads where all kinds of people encountered each other. And so if you go to a place like Afghanistan, you have people who look fairly European, people who look fairly East Asian, people who look pretty Middle Eastern, Right? all kind of mixed into the population because all those people have been coming to that place historically. Well, that shuffles all the genes up pretty well and can make it a little more difficult to figure out who's most closely related to whom. Because you don't, I mean, in an ideal world, in an I, I, ideal Darwinian model, you have these, this separation that happens between populations but of one original group, but then they're not always separated permanently. They may come back in contact with each other before they've speciated and exchanged genetic material again. That's fairly common in history, actually, not just with humans. I'm talking about with, with groups of living organisms. So speciation by separation between two population groups and them accruing mutations and becoming so different that they don't interbreed is the logical sort of hypothetical model for how this works. But in reality, it's messier, basically. And that's, you know, that requires a bit more sophistication in terms of figuring out historically what happened to people based on their genetic similarities and differences today. But if you look closely enough at it, the genetic information is so complex and, you know, it's extensive in its amount you can't answer these questions, but sometimes you have to look quite closely for individual mutations that are characteristic of certain populations, right? Well, you only find this, this particular mutation in, you know, people who live in South Pasadena or something like this, right? And that's, you know, so you have to identify a lot of those markers in order to start figuring out where people have been for, for the last, you know, so for the for the last hundred thousand years, but but the study of this, which is so interesting, like in terms of understanding human history for the last hundred thousand years, uh, from the genetic level, is the uh, subject of the research of what's called the Genographic Project 
uh, in particular uh, a, a researcher called Spencer Wells, uh, who has spent much of his career kind of trying to figure out how all of the world's peoples are related to each other using genetic evidence. And there's quite a good documentary film about it, uh, which I don't have on your syllabus, so we, we're not necessarily going to be watching it. Uh, but if you're interested in this, in this question, it's a ready-made research project for your final research project. The materials are out there. They're written in language anyone can understand. It's interesting. Um, if you have an interest in this sort of human history question, it's not a bad, it's not a bad topic, the genographic project it's called. I'll, I, when I give you this, the research project prompt, which won't be until uh, after the next test, but when I give you that prompt, it has a huge list of suggested possible topics for you, and that's on there, so you can do anything you want. But that's that's a good topic. It's a manageable topic, too. Yes? Yes. Yes. Well, for for example, like what the the genographic project would do would be, and they have done this, is that you look at genetic variations in populations of Native Americans, for example. And you look to see if other populations have those same variants. And essentially, um, what we see when we do comparative uh, genomics on Native Americans and populations from East Asia is that they're closely related. So the evidence suggests, and this is true of the archaeological evidence as well, that Native Americans came from Asia via a land bridge between Siberia and Alaska, and the genetics supports this quite well. The, the linguistics does, too. Some of the northern Native American languages are related to languages that are spoken by peoples in Siberia today. <laughs> So, um, you know, basically in terms of using the genetics to understand who's the most closely related, that's what genographers do, and that's what the data shows, that, that Asians and Native Americans are closely related. Now, if you look at, you know, Native Americans who live extremely far north, like in the Arctic, right, like people call the Eskimo, they're often referred to, although they generally go by the word Inuit, which is their name for themselves. You can just look at them and tell they're very Asian looking. I mean, they look very Asian. So people have always been aware of this long before the genetics ever got to the point where it was useful as data. But it's definitely supported by the data. So in terms of characteristics like you're describing, the fact that they're common between those two groups is expected. Yeah, but that's a, that's a good example. It's fascinating stuff, actually. If I had no, more time, I'd squeeze in some of the Spencer Wells uh, documentary. It's worth, it's worth watching. Uh, OK, so here's a summary. You probably have all of this in your notes, but just a little bit of information about causes of evolution. Um, this is all stuff we've kind of covered in a fair amount of detail. Let me do with my hair. Uh, so, um, Mutation produces heritable change in the structure of DNA. Some examples, sickle cell anemia, Huntington's chorea, we talked about Down syndrome, all types of mutation. Natural selection, uh, greater survival and reproduction of individuals with favorable traits. Beak size in Darwin's finches we talked about. Melanism could be something that's favored by natural selection under certain conditions, and you'll see that it is when we talk about human races. Uh, lactase deficiency is another one that we haven't yet talked about, but comes up in your book. Genetic drift is another cause. That's genetic change due to chance. Um, there does seem to be some genetic drift operating in terms of blood types and their prevalence in certain populations. I didn't really talk too much about this, but that's one potential example of genetic drift. And then finally, gene flow, the transfers of, transfer of genes between populations or lack of, and that too impacts things like um, like uh, blood types. So it, within gene flow, we would also include something like founder's effect, because what founder's effect is is sort of 
a separation of populations so that there isn't gene flow between them. I didn't list it up here, but I would include that down here on this last line. Okay, so I mean, this this is stuff. This is kind of a summary, and we've kind of gone over this stuff a couple of times. Um, and uh, hopefully, you feel like as I go over this right now with this chart that this is that this is familiar. Bless you, my my child, for you have sinned. Um, <laughs> Why do I always want to say that? Uh, so, but that's, I mean, this is just kind of a summary of some of the forces that affect evolution, allele frequency, genetics, change, mutation, all that stuff over time, okay? Let's, let's talk a little bit about the notion of the race concept as it's used by people and as understood within uh, anth uh, anthropology and biology. So what I'm going to review here is uh, biological perspectives on race. Um, and to those ends, I, I found this kind of feel-good picture of crayons. <laughs> if you played with crayons as a kid, like I did, you may have noticed that they call the crayon that's sort of like, I don't know, my skin color, flesh, right? Which is sort of ethnocentric, because whose flesh is it that's flesh? Really, all of these colors are flesh, depending who you're talking about. But Europeans have been historically pretty ethnocentric, if not racist. So they think flesh means this, which it doesn't necessarily mean this. And that's the point of my little crayon picture. Um, anyway, that has nothing to do with this topic. I just thought it was kind of neat and funny. I'll try to keep you laughing, keep the class pleasant, and not bury you under an avalanche of scientific information. <laughs> all right, so human races. What is race? What does race mean? You hear this term all the time. What, is, what do people say race means, right? Do you know your race? I asked you if you knew your blood type. A bunch of people knew your blood type. Do you know what race you are? Human, oh, that's so nice. Can, let's, can, I, can, I, just, can I give you a hug? That's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> when you, don't they ask you to put your race down on forms all the time? And what do you put? Other, white, <laughs> black. What are they? Let's list them. Hispanic. Let's go. There, there were actually there were six major categories for a long time until now it's kind of blown open and changed a bit. But for years the census and everybody else used six major categories. Okay, we can list them. So there's black or African American. I mean, there's different words for it, right? Um, interestingly and not surprisingly. Um, uh, you know, many of them are identified by a color for shorthand. It's like our crayon problem, right? So white might be called white, but it also might be identified by its old word, which is Caucasian. The word Caucasian is a misnomer. It was originally thought before genetics became at all sophisticated that the origins of so-called white people uh, were found in the Caucasus Mountains in Russia, but that doesn't turn out to be true. So Caucasian is is not really accurate, although it's still used, right? It used to be, you know, Asiatic races were called Mongoloid, and Caucasoid was Europeans, and Negroid was, was Africans, right? But the, all those terms are, are antiquated, but the one that's sort of stuck around is Caucasian. People still use this, but it's bullshit, okay? <laughs> it's, it's, it's also not true that, you know, these colors aren't accurate either, right? You're really sort of dark brown. I'm really kind of pinkish or something, <laughs> you know, but we kind of try to make things simpler. Uh, you can't... Native American is another one that gets on there. Sometimes they call it Native American Eskimo or something like that. Um, then, of course, Asian is another one. Um, Hispanic slash Latino, or sometimes they call it Hispanic non-white or something like that. <laughs> So what do we got? One, two, three, four, five. Those are, those are the main ones. And then the other one is the wastebasket category, which is sort of like other. OK? <laughs> it's like anybody that doesn't fit into the rest of it, we put in other. Now, this misses some people, actually. 
there's some people that don't fit into this and it automatically get stuck in other, right, sir? Yes. Yes. Well, more than me. Experts, experts greater than myself, yeah. How about African American? African American is, uh, I think, fine, right? Because basically it's saying that you're an, uh, you're an American person, like in terms of where you were born, but you have African heritage. Why? Do you, how do you feel about it? Because every time I have to fill out the form, they don't say black, they say African American. Right. But I've never been to Africa, and I was born in France. Right. So yeah, I mean, for somebody who is African and not of African origins, but not American, then you're not really African American, right? Um, so that might not apply to you. So what do you put? Do you put that or do you put other? I do not use French. You put French. Okay, fine. Good for you. I think we should all just make a, an effort to to screw this whole thing up because it's <laughs> it's got the, the the point that it's it's got so many problems actually. Right, and it does have a purpose, right? The reason why you, you're supposed to fill this sort of stuff out, you know, is because we live in a world where people aren't equal, they haven't been treated equally, historically, racism and all that stuff. And part of this is to try to address this historical issue, right? So, you know, if you are a black person in America, your, your life is disadvantaged because of racism in our society. That's, which is, this isn't really my topic today, but this is the reality of it. So there's a point to this, but the whole system has got its problems from a biological perspective, and you've already hit on one of them. There are a lot of them, and we can talk about some of them. One of them is this other category. There are whole groups of people, millions of people in the world, right, that don't fall under one of these categories. Now, granted, some of them don't have large populations in the U.S., but there's at least some of them in the U.S. Who isn't included in these groups besides French? <laughs> uh, Middle Easterners, right? Middle Easterners don't really, you know, tend to be called Asian per se. So we get the whole Middle East is, is, is lost, right? And sometimes they add that now as a category, Middle Easterner. Um, who else isn't in this? Yeah. Mixed people? Yeah, mixed people, okay? What do you do if you're my niece and nephew and your dad is white boy and your mom is a Japanese Peruvian, right? You're, you're going to be other, right, automatically. But, but what's tended, you know, what the interesting thing that's happened is what's tended to happen historically is is that People will identify themselves as the as the non-white. If they're if they're a combination like my niece and nephew of white and something else, they will identify as the non-white thing. And the reason for this is is that the white category is seen as something that really what were we gonna say? Yeah, it's like this notion of purity, and it's like if you're anything else, you can't be in the white category. It's like in, you know, like in the South when there used to be laws that black people and white people couldn't marry each other, right? If you were any part black at all, you would be called a black person, basically. You would be classified as a black person, treated like a black person, and only given the legal rights a black person had. And you could be, you know, 80% white, but that one little part of you, that little drop of blood or whatever you want to say, would make you black. So this is called hypodescent, actually. There's a term for this. Uh, the tendency historically to identify with the, whatever you want to call it, minority group, I guess you'd say. N not necessarily numerical minority, right? But this idea that the dominant category of whiteness is something that has to be pure or something. It's like some kind of idea of purity. You know, so, I mean, we, and this is still, of course, an issue, right? When, when you think about Obama, you say, oh, Obama's a black president, but he's actually half white and half black, but we call him a black person, right? Now, that's partly reflective of the way he looks, obviously, and that's what, you know, that's our next topic. But, you know, it's also the case that we define him by the thing that is the minority, the, the you know, the marginalized population, the, the non-dominant Right? So that's still going on today when supposedly, you know, if you listen to psycho conservatives like Ann Coulter, there's no such thing as racism anymore. It's like, whatever, you're nuts, lady. All right, so you got these six categories. Mixed people fall into other. Middle Easterners fall into other. Where do you put somebody who comes from India? 
right? Where do you put Australian Aboriginals, people from New Guinea? I mean, it goes on and on and on. There's a ton of people that aren't in this. So what happened over time, actually, and this is partly because people are marrying people that aren't in their group, the other category got bigger and bigger and bigger on the census. There were larger and larger numbers of people that didn't feel like they really fit in on this thing. Like, yeah, then, then they had to change it. They had to make it. They had to add more options. So sometimes they add more categories. Sometimes they had to fill in the blank. You can specify what other refers to and all this kind of thing. About ten-ish years ago, they modified the census. So now the census has combo categories, and you can. My niece and nephew can now say on the U.S. Census that they are Asian and white. And actually, you can go up to three. You can be Asian, white, and black, like my friend's kids, and you can specify that. Now, if you're more than three, then you're out of options, because by increasing it to three combo categories, there's now about 60 different options on the census. Right? Now, one of the interesting things, this is so interesting, one of the most interesting things is, is that the groups that fought the hardest against reforming the census from this, from this you know, faulty system were actually groups like the NAACP that represented minority interests because they felt if you start putting combo categories, it's going to reduce their numbers, right? It'll look like there's less black people in the world. And that's important for those groups because a lot of times their funding is tied to numbers, right? So all of these, all these groups that were fighting for sort of like racial equality actually fought against this, even though everyone knew against changing this, even though everyone knew that the system was faulty and simplistic. But eventually the census, it was just, it was unavoidable because the other category just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So they had to change it, and they did change it. Yes? Oh, well, you'd be covered then. <laughs> So the ones that were the most important to you or something? Huh. Gosh, that's interesting. Yeah, everybody's kind of coming up with different ideas about how to do this. Interesting. Well, I mean, uh, when I say that all human beings originate in Africa, by you know, in terms of the, uh, human evolution, I'm not urging you to claim you're an African American on the next, <laughs> on the next, unless you really are on the next application you fill out. So yeah, so now the next question is, we got these categories, right? The next question is, uh, how do we determine which group you're in? What is it that, that defines where you go on this? There's a couple of factors, obviously, enough. What defines it? Um, characteristics. characteristics, great. Like what? Uh, color. Skin color seems to be the most important, not the other one, only one, though. Eye, Eye color, color. Hair, texture. hair texture, Eye shape, nose shape, stuff like that, right? All those kinds of, most of them, are, you know, the main one is skin color, and then a number of them are mainly facial, right? Um, and these are the ways that we kind of recognize and identify each other, okay? Uh, so it's a list of traits like that. I mean, there's, you know, most of them are probably, uh, you're probably aware of, but then some of it, you know, when you, when you look at a person when you're walking down the road, right, and you sort of think to yourself, what group is this person in, if you do, you know, you can make a really quick judgment without thinking consciously about it. Like, in other words, for many people, this whole system is so ingrained that you can actually make these kinds of judgments without any conscious awareness or thought, right? So it's, I mean, this, the, 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 that's what happens when you create a simplistic system. A simplistic system converts itself very easily to becoming part of the way we think. And that's, you know, the simplicity of this. Is, is really sort of one of the reasons why it's, it's so sort of successful in a way, and in a bad way, right? By successful, I mean that it's caused lots of historical problems, and it's, it's been something that's tremendously difficult for people to overcome socially, right? Um, so it's, you know, it's big, a big problem for our, our society. In other countries, do they classify races like that? Or 
it varies everywhere. There are some similar some similarities. I you know I had a friend who did research in Brazil, where there's a whole spectrum, and you have a lot of you know uh, immigrant people marrying into populations, and you know a really high percentage of the Brazilian population is part African in their heritage, but then they don't always look it, and their classification system is actually you know, somewhat like this, but not really very different, yeah. So different countries, that's a very good point, that different countries have different systems. And part of the American system comes from the fact that, you know, this is a nation that belonged to Native Americans and that Europeans came to and then forced Africans to come to as slave labor. So those three categories have a particular importance in the United States. In other words, to put it another way, in America, we tend to see things in black and white. The problem is that black and white is not the whole reality. It's part of the reality, right? And the reality is more complicated. Sir? Oh, great. Totally. But yes. Also, the whole concept of white is the, the idea, because even for like Europeans who uh, came from over here, the whole idea was to to kind of like abandon your European heritage because white doesn't necessarily mean white doesn't necessarily mean like uh, Irish. A culture. Yeah. 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 So, Right, and to group them together or whatever. Although that was an ugly process. I mean, it used to be, you know, it used to be Irish hated Italians and, you know, everybody hated Polish and, you know, it's... It <laughs> of, of white in the U.S. Yeah, no, totally, that's so true. Did you, have you taken, who, what class was Juge or who? Yeah. yeah, he's great. Love Juge. You should all take sociology with Juge. He'll, he'll get, he gets into this question in a lot more detail. I'm, I'm really just kind of giving you background about the biology of it. But let me give you a few more points. I'm not going to get through all the material today, but let's move on a little bit, get through a few more things. We'll get to skin color probably next Monday. Um, so from a biological perspective, humans are what are called polytypic, which means that we're composed of populations that differ in their expression of traits. But we're a polytypic species, meaning that we're all the same species. This results from a number of factors, but the most important ones appear to be, to some extent, natural selection, to some extent, sexual selection, and then also just the natural process of the isolation of populations, that is to say, deems as we define them. The notion of races as we understand them are based largely on phenotypic differences that gradually change over a geographic area. So in other words, it's not exactly true, but basically the further apart two groups of people come from, the more different they will tend to look. It's simplistic, but that's sort of a broad truism. So it's based on largely on phenotypic differences that gradually change over a geographic area. And phenotypic differences changing over, gradually changing over a geographic area can be shown on a map. And that map is called a Klein. And I'll show you an example of a Klein in just a moment. In fact, we can make the Klein the last of the, of the slides today. I'll let you guys take off. I do, yeah. Do and we get we get into some of this in that class too. Not as much as ethnic studies and sociology, but a bit. Because you know one of the things, like for example, in physical anthropology in this class, physical anthropology started out being 
the study of physical differences between human populations. But, and it was all phenotypic measurements because nobody understood what genes were back then, right? But that's where the origins of this, you know, it's a very different field today than it was back then. This is a Klein uh, here. Um, so this is a Klein that shows the distribution of skin color based on lights, the reflection of light from the skin. You can measure the absorption or reflection of light. So dark absorbs more light, light reflects it. And basically this is a map of the world before colonialism, right, where, 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 where people, populations originated. So when it shows that, you know, Australia is populated by people that have a range of, a darker range of skin, they're talking about Australian aboriginals. They're not talking about Nicole Kidman or something, you know. Um, and, and, I mean, and, and this is sort of a loose cline. It's messy because people move around. But the general tendency, and this is what we'll get back to in the next class, is that the darkest people are found where? Africa, but we would actually say in the tropics or near the equator is how it tends to work. The New World is a bit exceptional in this way. But the closer you are to the equator, the darker you are is essentially the way it works. The further away you are, the lighter you are. And this will be our subject next time. We'll talk about skin color and its relationship to human populations in more detail. But let's, let's go ahead and leave there, you guys, today. Um, come pay me for the zoo. And I will see everybody who's going to the zoo uh, this Saturday, because I will be there to check you in.